Ronnie Brewer is a former eight-year NBA pro, former lottery pick, former Arkansas All-American as well, and then most recently, the latest addition to Arkansas's coaching staff, taking over as the recruiting coordinator. So, Ronnie, I, I, congratulations. I know that hire has been met with a lot of excitement around Fayetteville. You're excited yourself. It's funny, we connected on Twitter not long ago, and I reached out. I said, would love to have you on the show because I think you you represent a lot. You embody a lot. You know, you represent your state. You represent Arkansas. Fayetteville is your hometown. You went to high school, quite literally a stone's throw from Arkansas's campus in the shadows of, of Bud Walton Arena. You know, I, I think all of this really means a lot to you. So it goes without saying congratulations. You, you bring this unique perspective to the Arkansas staff, this NBA perspective at a program where Eric Musselman, of course, runs the show and, and a program that has this trajectory that is, of course, going up. So quite simply, great to have you on. Can't wait to detail some moments during your MBA career, your time at Arkansas, this, this new endeavor for you. Thanks for the time. I hope it's been a good, what, month and a half, two months on the job so far as well. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, it has been only a, a month, but, you know, I, I had the ground running. Uh, I'm very appreciative of the opportunity Coach Musman gave me to come back to my alma mater uh, and be able to work in this in this position as the recruiting coordinator. Uh, I know, like you said, I'm from Fayetteville, Arkansas. I went to school here. Uh, it was a lot of excitement around the hiring. I was very excited. The staff was very excited. And, you know, I think we just bring a, a really unique aspect to, you know, the University of Arkansas. You know, a lot of people would say, you know, they can get you to the next level, um and you know or or whatever whatever it it may be but not many coaching staffs can say you know you, you've had a head coach in eric musselman you've had a head coach in key smart you, you had you know assistant coach and you know uh player personnel analytics in in clay Mosier. you know mike econom worked with the spurs for five years uh coach ruda uh was in the g league and myself being, you know, a pro, um, now a coach, uh, and now a recruiting coordinator, I think it, it, it's a different dynamic. And um, our personalities and our experiences have really, really meshed very well together. Yeah, you outlined just the significance, the value on this staff. So it has been a short amount of time, but what have these current Razorbacks asked you the most about the NBA or your time in the NBA? You know, a lot of guys are asking, you know, one, you know, what it took to get to the NBA, which for me, I, you know, I love being able to give knowledge to these guys. You know, I was by far not the, the best shooter, the best ball handler, best passer, most athletic. I, I wasn't any of those. But one of the things that allowed me to stick in the NBA and be a starter on most teams and, and, and play, you know, eight-year career was – and being a great locker room guy, being a phenomenal teammate and outworking your opponent and always consistently working and being a true, true pro and, and telling that to a, to a college kid is, you know, you have to treat this in your brand like a, a business. You, know, you, you want to be, you know, sitting in the front of the classroom, you know, to, to, to tell your professors, professors that you're not just an athlete, that, that you're a student athlete and you're you're. Uh, academics is just as important and you know putting the work in you know getting your conditioning getting your body right in the weight room your nutrition is just as important as you getting up shots uh, uh you know on the gun or working with the with the coach so you know telling those things and, and how that related to, to to my career has gone a long way uh, i think the guys are buying in and when you look at guys on the staff to be like, hey, you know, these guys know what they're talking about. They, they've been here. They've been they've done that. They've seen everything. There's there's a, there's a seat. Uh, I think it's it's reflected back to them as, you know, maybe I can use these guys as a crutch to get to the next level. <clears throat> you talk about just work ethic. You earned this reputation during your playing days at Arkansas, but also in the NBA as well as being this really vicious defender. How did that happen? Why, why did you become such a strong defender at the next level in the NBA? I mean, it's, it's a funny story because, you know, a lot of people are, that are around me, I mean, I almost averaged 30 points in high school. I led the SEC in scoring, uh, you know, after my, my junior year before I went pro. So, 
you know, in my head, uh, you know, I was I was a scorer. You know, I was a person that was versatile that could play multiple positions on the offensive end. And, and I get I get to Utah, and, and Coach Sloan is, is, you know, a hard hard you know, nose coach. You know, recipes Coach Sloan. But he told me one th one thing. He called me in. And he, he he gave me uh, a, a list of the roster. Tell me something on there that that you could tell the difference between them and you. <clears throat> so I started going down the list. You know, I, I gave out a whole bunch of answers. Uh, you know, we got a couple guys that were, you know, that were foreign. A couple guys that didn't go to college. You know, a couple guys that have been on the All Star team. A couple guys that are not rookies. I'm the only rookie really that was playing at that time. Um, and every answer I would give him was, he was like, "No, that's not it. You're missing. You're missing. You're not. You're not. You got to look deeper. You got to dive a little bit deeper." And I'm like. Well, coach, what, what, what are you saying? And I was like, you know, they make more money than me as veterans. They're like, no, they, they do, but that's not what I'm asking for. And I was like, well, what is it? He's like, Darren Williams, Derek Fisher, Andre Kirilenko, Carlos Bo Boozer, Memino Kerr, Matt Harpering. Um, all these guys are scores. They're, they're, they're known for their offensive game. And one of the things that we don't have other than their, their offensive game, their leadership and maybe rebounding or whatnot or, or blocking shots is we didn't have a lockdown defender. And he said, if you want to play as a rookie for my team, you've got to carve a niche out. You know, you've got to adapt. Or you can continue to do the same things that you've been accustomed to doing and wait your turn and sit on the bench and your time will come. You'll develop, you'll, you'll, you'll learn from watching. Um, and, and I was a guy that was like, you know what, I'm willing to do anything and everything that allow my team to win. If that means sacrificing my shots, that means I need to be a facilitator. If I need to be the best cheerleader on the bench or a different extra set of eyes for the, the anybody on the floor that while I'm on the bench, you know, I was gonna just be the best teammate I possibly could be. And so, it happened to be one game that we were playing the Lakers and Kobe was dominating. We were, I, I, I was recall me, Paul Mills, and D Brown, who were rookies that year, you know, watching Kobe, we were like, man, this, this is, this dude's like watching the video game. Like when you're playing with a video game, he had 30 points going into halftime and we, we go in the locker room and, you know, coach Sloan is blowing up on everybody's, you know, using some explicit words and, you know, challenging people's manhood saying like, you know, you guys are scared of Kobe Bryant and you guys are all laying down and backing down from him and, and not taking on the challenge. And you know, I told Coach Sloan, I'm not really scared of no man. I'm scared of God, but I'm not scared of no man. Like, you know, I respect Kobe. Rest in peace to Kobe. I respect every NBA basketball player because they had a journey to get him to the next level. But I'm not, I wasn't scared of anybody. You know, I've seen a lot of things in my life. I, I'm not scared of anybody. So I was like, man, dude, I'm not scared of anybody. I respect his game, but I'm not scared of him. And so I guess my big mouth kind of uh, stuck my foot in my mouth. And so he was like, okay, if you're not scared of him, you're going to start on him in the second half. And so the second half I went in the game and, you know, just, I just competed. You know, one of the things that I told myself is I'm not going to be a trash talker. Um, I'm going to respect the game and respect my opponent, but they're going to have to respect me too. And I'm going to compete every possession and I'm not going to make it easy every possession. And I think Kobe respected that because every battle we had, like nobody ever shut Kobe Bryant down. Nobody's ever or ever will, you know, but it's the competition and competing every possession. And I think I did that to the best of my ability. I think that's why he respected me. So I think that gained a lot of respect from Coach Sloan and he got a lot of trust in me and that kind of carved my niche of being a defensive stopper because that's what we needed on the team. It's a, it's a great lesson in just that how do you sustain or lengthen your NBA career? That All of that leads me now to my next question. Like, who did you love playing then, or which players did you love defending and why, if you remember a few? Um, I mean, I love to take challenges, and so I love to guard all the greats. You know, when I was coming in, you know, the Vince Carters, the Dwayne Wades, Melo Anthony, um, Kobe, you know, Gilbert Arenas, uh, Paul Pierce, 
um, Michael Red, um, Manu Ginobili, um, let's see, Jason Richardson, Brandon Roy, um, Kevin Martin was a tough, uh, tough assignment. Um, so, you know, Joe Johnson is, I mean, the list go on because I played the two, I started the two, but then I, they moved me to, and had confidence in me to, to guard the threes. You know, if AK was hurt, um, I, I'd start at the three. Um, the majority of the time I started the two. And then when I was in Chicago, you know, if, if Luau picked up a foul, I, I'd guard the three. Or if Dwayne Wade, we were playing the Heat, Dwayne Wade got subbed out, I'd probably guard LeBron a, a few plays. But, you know, each and every game that, you know, was on the schedule, whoever we played up played against, there was a phenomenal matchup each and every night. You know, uh, I recall AK going down and getting hurt. And coach is like, hey, you're going to have to move over to the three. And, you know, I was just like, man, the, we had Paul Pierce and LeBron and uh, Stephen Jackson and Gerald Wallace and Paul Pierce. And and um, it was just back to back to back to back. And I was like, man, like I don't ever get a night off. But that comes with the territory and that comes with being the NBA and to me, it allowed our team and our teams to, to, to gel really well together because everybody had each other's back. And so each matchup, my teammate knew it was a hard matchup for me, but they saw how hard I was competing each and every possession. They saw if there was a loose ball, there was a no question that I was diving down there to get it. If there was somebody driving to the basketball, it was a, it was a no brainer that I was going to slide over and try to take a charge. So uh, it, it, it was a personal challenge for me to guard against all these guys, but I think it, it, it brought out the best in our teams uh, throughout those years as well. And everything you just laid out, it's, it's no wonder the value that you're bringing to the table to be able to share all of this with these current Razorbacks. You're referencing your time with the Jazz. I mentioned you were a lottery pick. You were taken by Utah. That's where you began your career. I guess I could have added this or I, I perhaps maybe left this out of my introduction because I, I, I think we could also say Ronnie Brewer was also maybe the most stylish or well-dressed player <laughs> in the green room of the 2006 NBA draft. The, yeah. the blue suit, man. Yeah, man, it was it was it was something that was it was kind of off the wall because, um, you know, there was a company that was making the everybody's suits um for, that was in the lottery and so we all took one set of pictures majority of everybody had the same suit because it was made by the same company a couple of the guys had a little bit of color in it but nothing crazy um and i had a friend of the family that that made a suit and was like hey man if you if you get a wild hair on your body you know this is a suit that i, I custom made for you and so <clears throat> I had no idea where I was going uh, prior to it, but I was like, man, I want to do something different because, you know, I, I'm different as a person. My game is different. My shot is unique. Um, and I bring a uniqueness uh, uh, to the NBA from, from, you know, where I'm from. So, I, you know, I, I wore the blue suit, um, ended up getting drafted by the Jazz, the basketball matched, the hat matched. Uh, so we had a lot of fun <laughs> after getting my name called in the, in, in the back, taking pictures and, you know, maybe I, I made the newspaper uh, in New York for, you know, one of the top dress. So uh, I think it was a good call. It's a fun game to play. And that is to like, look back 15, 20, 25 <laughs> years and watch like the evolution of the suit of the style. Look, what is the best story then from draft night or the lead up, which is always entertaining. Well, what people don't know is like maybe the number one pick might know where they're going, maybe the number two, and you have an idea of where you're at. But honestly, you really don't know until your name is called. And for us, we knew like the first two picks were like who they were going to be. And then after that, it was a, it's a toss up. And so everybody thought the number three pick was going to be Rudy Gay and that was going to be a no-brainer Rudy Gay for sure um and then Rudy doesn't get drafted three and then you're kind of like oh crap like 
now what are we going to do? And then you kind of see him fall a little bit and different people are picked ahead of him. And so it, 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 it turns for a wild ride of emotions. You know, you're very happy and appreciative to be there because you finally know sooner or later your name's going to get called. You're going to get to walk across the stage and meet David Stern and shake his hand and give him a hug and give him the biggest smile uh, to everybody back home. And so, you know, even the, prior to the hotel, you know, teams calling my agent um, and then getting to the Madison Square Garden and teams are still calling my agent. I'm having to call and or answer, answer different questions um, from different front office uh, personnel. And so uh, to finally get my name called, to walk across, shake his hand, smile, and know that, every, that I'm making everybody back home proud and go on the back, take the pictures, and then get on the phone with Jerry Sloan and Kevin O'Connor, who was in the front office at that time, and just tell them how appreciative I am to be a part of their, their organization. And then, you know, quickly go and get something to eat, you know, talk about our emotions. And then we, we jumped on a plane that next morning and flew to Utah to do our press conference. So it was a whirlwind and it's crazy. But one of the things I was the most nervous about was, you know, if you've ever been to the draft or if you've ever watched the draft, uh, New York fans could be kind of unruly. And so, you know, you didn't know if, they were going to cheer for you or if they were going to boo you when your name was called. So I was like, man, please don't let them boo me in front of everybody, man. Please don't let me boo me. But luckily they cheered for me. Um, and, you know, I was able to have a, a phenomenal experience. Yeah, there is no guessing what the crowd is going to do. Sometimes it can be vicious. But do you, you probably remember who went third. I just pulled it up in that draft. Yes. Uh, I think it was Bargnani. I think it was. Adam Morrison was second. Lamarcus Aldridge, and then Adam Morrison. Adam Morrison, yeah, and and yeah, Lamar, yeah. So we kind of knew one, two, three. I forgot about Lamarcus Aldridge, but like four, five, six, seven. All those were like now it was up in the air. Like no, nobody knew that Sheldon Williams was going to go the high to the Hawks, and you know, no, nothing against Sheldon Williams. Like, I think he's a phenomenal player, had a phenomenal high, uh, college career, phenomenal high school career. But we just didn't think that he was going to go that high. And so when he did, everyone was like, whoa, crap. You, you kind of get a buzz about where people are at or where they're going because you work out with a lot of these guys. And, and the unanimous take on it was Rudy Gay was very, very good in his workouts. Randy Foyer was very, very good in his workouts. But to me, Brandon Roy was – by far the best in those workouts. And so we thought he was going to be really, really, really high to the front. And, you know, then it went one, two, three. And then, you know, I, I knew Tyrus Thomas because we played against each other when he was at LSU. That was kind of a shocker. Not, not to take it away from Tyrus because Ty, Tyrus is a phenomenal player, phenomenal talent. And I had to go against him at LSU. And so, you know, I knew what he could do. But just going from – the, the temperature of what you heard and the rumors that were going around, you didn't expect some of those guys to go up there. And, um, you know, it, 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 it's for sure a roller coaster of emotions because now you're like, oh, well, I thought this guy was going here. And then I got myself slotted in here. And then when you say it doesn't happen, you're like, okay, this might be a long night. So the live drama of sports, the live drama of the NBA draft as well. <laughs> you put, you came out after your junior year at Arkansas your your father also left a profound impact at Arkansas. That's Ron Brewer. He he led the program to a Final Four when he played there. He also was in the NBA for a number of years. I mean, how did growing up with a dad who played in the league for eight years, was also an All-American at Arkansas, basically make you a better person and player as well? What were the examples? Well, first of all, a lot of people were like, oh, man, your dad went to Arkansas. You're for sure going to go to Arkansas. And that, that – wasn't necessarily the thing. Uh, my dad has been a phenomenal crutch for me as far as, you know, asking, um, you know, be able to ask, like, what's going on? And so, you know, in my recruitment, he allowed me to just be open and didn't put any pressure on me. And, you know, when I made the decision to go to Arkansas, you know, he chimed in and was like, okay, well, you know, this is what it's going to take to be successful. You're going to have to, you know, outwork your opponent. You're going to, you know, have to come in before, stay after, get in the best shape, continue to develop your game, continue to watch film. 
um, and, and separate like what he did for me creating my own journey, my own path, because we're two different people. So he's been great for me, you know, not, not only my time at the University of Arkansas, but my time in the NBA. And, you know, I was blessed to be able to have a dad that went through what a lot of people not, have not had that situation and hadn't been fortunate enough to be able to experience that. But, you know, there's, the, there's times where you have bad shooting nights. There's times where you lose games and you need a person to be able to talk to. Um, and, and, you know, for, for me, it was my dad and he, he experienced those, those, those same, same situations. And so it made those situations a lot easier to cope with. Where would you have gone had you not commit to Arkansas? Well, it's, it's a funny story because uh, one of my mentors uh, who, you know, he's, he's one of the assistant coaches at Fayetteville High School, Nick Bradford. Nick Bradford signed and went to the University of Kansas. So, you know, being from Fayetteville and going and playing at Kansas and they were super successful, everybody was here was a Razorback fan, but we were also Nick Bradford and Kansas Jayhawk fans. And so I would go up there and visit him and sometimes go to late night. And I went to their basketball camp and, you know, Roy Williams gave me some advice that stuck with me you know, to this day. And he says, man, you know, everybody is going to ask you, you know, why your form looks like that. And, you know, a lot of people, he's like, I've heard this story. You had a water accident slide or an accident on a slide. And it makes you shoot like that. He says, and a lot of people are going to probably try to come at you and try to change your shot. He says, but what I would tell you is I'm not going to try to change your shot, but I'm going to tell you is make those non-believers believers with your work ethic, staying in the gym and making that habitual where it's a habit and you have muscle memory where it's, it's, it's something that you work on so much that people don't think of your shot because of its result, it goes in. And, and that's what I did and, you know, in high school, you know, I worked on it so much where, you know, coaches came out and they were like, Okay, it doesn't look good, but it, 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 the final product is it goes in the basket. Same thing in college, same thing in the pros. So I, I was probably going to go wherever he went during the recruiting process. Royal Williams left Kansas to go to North Carolina. Um, I instantly became a North Carolina fan. But unfortunately, at that time, they only had one scholarship. And Rayshon Terry had already committed. He was, he was from there, and he just didn't feel like it was right to – take his scholarship. And so I respected it. And, you know, uh, Stan, he got on at Arkansas and, and recruited me harder than anybody else. And it was a hard, came down to the wire between Arkansas, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, uh, UConn. Um, but ultimately, Arkansas was the best fit for me. You've been subtly detailing just the sacrifices, the hard work. We, we've kind of been Edging up close to that topic, I want to dive a little further in. I, CJ McCollum was a guest on a podcast I love. He was on JJ Reddick's show recently, and, and, he, and he detailed a story about how when he was in high school, he actually changed the alarm sound, like his alarm clock on his phone, to a voice recording of him saying, repeating this phrase, I'm going to get a D1 scholarship. I'm going to average 20 points a game. I'm going to reach the NBA. To which JJ responds like, endearingly that's psychotic but it's that you need that kind of psychotic determination yeah. to, to achieve your goals like what would be the best example for you of just a next level determination dedication sacrifice that it took to ultimately do what you did and have the sustained career in the nba well this is a, this is a funny situation but like i think a lot of like hoopers can relate to this like you come up in, in, in your, you know, the top dog, either, you know, your local high school, your AU team, whatever circuit you're on, you know, you're getting a lot of offers, you're, you're producing, um, and you got there not by just sitting on your butt, by putting in the time and the work and, you know, if it's conditioning or lifting weights or getting up shots, whatever your routine was, you know, you feel like that elevated your game to get to a certain status. Well, regardless of when that was, if you moved up in basketball, there's always another alpha dog or somebody competing at a higher level. 
And so it happened when I went from junior high to high school, I had to find that person and be like, well, I got to outwork him because, you know, that's what he's doing. Then from high school to college, oh, I found that guy. I have to outwork him to get results. And then you go from college to the NBA. Well, everybody has that elite work ethic and has been that guy, that alpha male, that alpha dog. And it was just great to see other players putting in and buying into um, having success. And I think a lot of fans think that people just wake up, go on the, you know, the court, the field, the track, the, the diamond, and just produce. They don't seem the, the behind the scenes of what it, what it took to master a craft and allow you to be elite. And so, you know, I remember the first day uh, I, I get to Utah, I see coach, uh, you know, Coach Sloan and the other guys uh, in their offices. And I was like, okay, I'll, I'm, I'm going to be the first guy to be on the court and, and bust my butt and show that, hey, day one, I'm going to outwork my opponent. And, you know, I kind of hear music playing. I was like, what the, what the heck is that? And, you know, we go in there and uh, Derek Fisher's in there, his, his, his training coach, Aubrey, and they've been in there working for like two and a half hours. And I was like, what are, you, what are y'all doing here? And they're like, oh, man, we're just you know, getting some work in before we get to in the weight room. And they're going to you know, condition and then we're going to come back again. I'm like, dang, y'all going to get four workouts in today? He's like, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the, just the tip of the iceberg. And you can have stories like that each and every, everywhere you go, no matter what gym you go to, there's always a gym rat that's going to be in the gym busting his butt. Um, and I used to tell this to people all the time. You know, I was able to be able to play with some of the best in the world. You know, if it was at Utah or Memphis or Chicago, or New York, Houston. Um, I knew, like, seeing guys like my rookie year, you know, we wanted to come to come to the arena super early because, you know, Coach Sloan told us he didn't play many rookies, so – we wanted to be in condition, we, to be in the best shape. We had condition, we had to get shots up. And we did that before the games because a lot of times we wouldn't do it before. We wouldn't be able to get in the game. But I used to see like, you know, KG, Kobe Bryant, T-Mag, Gilbert Arena running before, before their game, getting up shots. They're in a full sweat hours before the game even started. And I'm like, man, these dudes are all-stars and Hall of Fame dudes, and they're working just as hard as we are, rookies trying to scratch the surface into the NBA. And so I knew then that, you know, you've got to continue to work, and nothing comes easy, and you've got to outwork your opponent. You were a starter for several years in Utah. Just about the midway mark, you know, before the trade deadline is over, your fourth year, you're traded from Utah to Memphis. Mm -hmm. What do you remember about that day? <laughs> Uh, I thought it was, uh, I thought it was the craziest situation ever. Um, you know, it was right after the All-Star break. We're in New Orleans. We we had beat them going on the road to go go to Golden State. And, you know, Coach Sloan was like, hey, man, you guys got to relax. We've got to gel together as a team. This is the most important part of the year. Uh, this last push, nobody's going to get traded. Y'all can relax about that and just go out there and, and buy in, be one unit and, and figure it out. And I remember us going to get our bags, getting on the plane, and I kept on getting a like a, a call on my cell phone. It was like a private, like a private call, like a block number. Kept on hitting the client. I was like, man, I don't answer like private or block numbers. It was crazy. I was like, I'm not answering that. But my agent calls me was like hey what are you doing I was like you know I'm I'm about to I'm about to get on the plane and go to Golden State and he was like hey man you know it's gonna hit it's gonna hit the news pretty soon like you just got traded to the the Memphis Grizzlies and you know if, unless you want to fly across the United States and back probably off the plane so I was like hey hey stop the plane everybody looks at me crazy they stopped the plane I get up, I go back to Coach Sloan. I was like, hey, Sloan, Coach Sloan, you know, I, I appreciate the opportunity uh, for drafting me. I appreciate the opportunity to trust in me, allow me to play as a rookie. 
and the faith to allow me to start for you for all the games that I did and you know all the wins that we we won and even the tough times I just appreciate the opportunity he looked at me like man what the hell are you talking about dude and I was like what well, I, mean, I just got traded to Memphis Grizzlies and you know he said some cuss words and I turned I looked at BZ he was Brian Zeller he's a uh, uh, head uh, trainer at the time he was an assistant trainer and equipment manager I was like hey man do you think you could help me find my bags under the plane so I could, you know, they, they got me a flight out of New Orleans to Memphis. It's a way shorter flight than flying from New Orleans to San Francisco, San Francisco back to Memphis. And, you know, we got off and my phone is vibrating because ESPN had just announced it. And my teammates are texting me like, man, this is BS. I can't believe this is happening. You would think that we would trade for a better piece or more draft picks, but why would you trade a starter for this, this, and this? And um, it is, it is at that particular time, it, it allowed me to realize it was, you know, basketball is also a business. It's just not a game. It's not for fun. And uh, there's, there's sometimes situations where they don't work out the best for you because uh, it, it, it doesn't make sense business wise. It, it's just a real surreal rather. I mean, an illustration yeah. of, the business of sport. I mean, what was the immediate, did you get the bag? Did you like, you were on a tarmac and you had to get off the plate. Like what was the immediate aftermath of that? It was, it was, it was insane because like they pull, they pull the plane over to the side. Cause when we pri we fly out of a private airport. So they pulled it to the side and was like, you know, it's me and Brian Zeller outside this huge plane. And he's, you know, I'm standing there by the plane and you can see me outside the window, but I'm talking to BZ like, you know, he's trying to go through the go through everybody's luggage to see if he can find my my luggage. And he was like, you know, we, we had a good conversation and, you know, just say that was a you know phenomenal you know person to be around. And, you know, was always helping in the community and he never had any problems with me. And, you know, he wishes me the best. And, you know, he's always going to, you know, root if. Texas A&M ever played Arkansas, which, you know, uh, we, we, to this day, we still text each other every time they play um, in the SEC, which is, is coming up actually uh, at Cowboy Stadium. But, um, you know, it was just a surreal feeling, that, that eerie feeling, because, you know, you're sad and you're mad at the same time because you're like, why would you trade me? I'm starting on here. I'm helping the team. I've been contributing. Um, and... You know, the owner who passed away, you know, before he passed away, you know, told my family, hey, I man, we, we are investing in Ronnie. We plan to have him here for a long time. And so that's what your mindset is like, how, you know, I'm going to get a house out here. You know, I love the fans. I love the city. I love the team, the team chemistry. Um, but, but again, you, you find out pretty fast that the, the business of basketball. It's wild. Fast forward then just, just shortly after that. You were part of those Bulls teams. Yeah. Early, early, you know, 2010, 2011, 2012, back to back years, the Bulls have the best record in the NBA, went to the East Finals in 2011. That, just zooming in on that particular time in general, I mean, you want to talk about NBA history and just the attention and eyeballs on that season alone for obvious reasons. This is the first year after maybe, maybe the, the, the first kind of ever really a big free agency period. LeBron James's first year in Miami. That's who you guys play in the East Finals in 2011. I mean, for look, for better or for worse, I mean that that Miami team kind of got vilified, you know, just stating objectively, but that was an inc you guys had an incredible team. You play Miami that year in the East Finals. I mean, how palpable was just the the energy or the, the disdain, the passion, like yeah. in that series, being in that moment in time where like everybody's attention was on, was, was on LeBron and D Wade and, and Chris Bosch's heat. And you guys meet them in the East finals. Yeah, it was a lot of, a lot of eyes, you know, for me, it was a, it was a crazy situation because uh, my agent, uh, Henry Hank Thomas, rest in peace. And he was an agent from, you know, he represented me, he represented Dwayne Wade uh, Chris Bosch, Udonis Haslam, uh, that were all playing in 
that series and you know just all the time like him coming down I'm gonna come watch the games and he's trying to grab dinner after the games with everybody I'm like I don't want to talk to these guys have dinner anything you know this we're, we're locked in it's us versus them we're going on the battlefield you know some of the you know they talk correct like noise you know a couple of our guys talk noise and but at the end of the day it was just a hard fought season hard hard, hard fought series and you know i always tell people you know you got to tip your hat to, to them because all the pressure was on you know lebron d wade bosh joining forces in and and having to win you know any misstep was was magnified you know if they didn't if they lost the game oh my gosh they lost the game which you know come on you're gonna lose games in in a, in a season so um uh, they were just more, I would say, I wouldn't say mature, but I would say more experienced um, in, in those situations um, in, in, that, in, the, in the playoffs. You know, guys had been to the conference finals. Guys have excelled and succeeded. For, for us, you know, me, Kyle, and well, just me and Booz have been in the Eastern Conference Finals in Utah and lost. But outside of that, I mean, there weren't many guys that had a lot of experience in the playoffs like that. You know, maybe first round or whatnot. Uh, Joe Keem and, and D Rose and Luau, and um, you know, you know, that's why I think our second we were we were so focused and and and, and had a, a, a laser beam focused because we were like, man, we we were there, we we're right there. Our first year, you know, finished first in the East and. You know, that next year we were like, hey, you know, we know what it takes to to, to beat these guys and win. And you know, then that year, that's the year D Rose went down and kind of took a lot of air out of ourselves. It, it, it was really tragic how that did play out. You're right. I mean, D Rose tearing his ACL, but but it does not cover up the fact that, yeah, I mean, you guys are the best team in the East, best team in the record wise in the NBA. Back to back years, it was this this spectacle of Derrick Rose. It was his introduction to the league. Yeah, it was the bench mob. It was Boozer. Mm -hmm. It was Joe Kim Noah. Like, how invigorating! How much fun were those two years in Chicago yeah. for you? It was so much fun because, to be honest, everybody put everything in it because we knew how important it was for D Rose to win in Chicago. You know. There's not many situations where guys grow up in a town and they get they're drafted to their hometown with you know number one overall. You know, LeBron's from Cleveland or LeBron's from Akron and he goes to Cleveland, and that's almost as close and similar as, as you can get. But there's not many people that are drafted one to their hometown Chicago and you know wins rookie of the year. There's basically um, saying he's the next Jordan and, you know, he, we put a good core around him and played so hard offensively and defensively, shared the basketball. Our, you know, we were so unselfish as, as a whole uh, and our number one goal was to win games. And it made it a lot of fun. You know, a lot of people, I think, from the outside looking in was like, well, Tibbs was this, Tibbs was that. To me, Tibbs, Tibbs is a phenomenal coach. He should have won Coach of the Year every year he's, he was there. And, I, you know, that's why you see what he's doing with the Knicks so quickly. He's got guys buying into his culture. Um, and I think we did that as soon as we got there. And kind of the rest was history. The D-Rose floater. How cool. It, it, he's got it, man. Yeah. <laughs> this iteration of D-Rose with the Knicks. It, it, it was kind of, it's kind of crazy because you saw – how hard he was developing to, to make that a uh, go-to like move that he could make. And like the nights and the days in the pre and post practices where he was working on his floater and working on his pull-up jump shot and working on his catch and shoot jump shot, because, you know, even though he's not very outgoing as far as the media and stuff like that, you know, he hears the negative stuff that people say. So, that, you know, one of the things, well, he can't shoot. People are just going to go under the screen. He's just an athletic guard. You know, he developed that shot and worked his butt off to make it consistent. And, you know, to me, you know, that's to me why D. Rose is such a phenomenal player because he's developed and molded his game. 
when he hurt, got hurt, but you know, his athleticism wasn't at the height that it was, but that's where his floater and his mid-range pull-up and uh, his catch and shoot has has excelled because he had to he had to mold and develop his game. Last one on the your time with the Bulls before transitioning back to some Arkansas stuff. I would be remiss if I didn't bring this this uh, whole phenomenon up. I mean, could you provide any backstory, any like never revealed details on the Man. Carlos Boozer? <laughs> hair dye slash shoe polish game man the funniest thing is we're 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 in boston and we're gonna have a practice before we we play the celtics and so you know if anybody knows tibbs like when tibbs has a practice it's not like oh my shoes are gonna be untied i'm gonna have sweats on i'm gonna be going half ass it's you know you're taped up shoes tight you know, do something pre-practice, post-practice, and you're gonna have a good sweat because you're gonna we're gonna play extremely hard in practice. No matter if it's you know 30, 45, an hour, hour, 30 minutes, you're gonna work extremely hard in that in that period of time that we have scheduled. So you could kind of paint the picture of everybody's you know out their sweats, they've got their shirts tucked in, they're getting up shots with a coach, or they're you know they're look watching the film. But everybody's doing something. But it's, it, it is cold, and it's, it is cold in this gym because um, it's wintertime. So Booz has, like, his sweats on and a beanie. So, you know, Tibbs oh. is like, yo, Booz, come on, pick your pace up. Let's go. It's time, it's time to practice. <laughs> Booz, Booz comes out of out his, his, his uh, sweat top, but he has, like, pants on and a beanie, and he's getting up shots. He's like, Booz, like, Come on, man, like, get going, you know, take the sweats off. Let's go. So Booz takes the bottoms off, and, like, this, we're, like, starting practice. He's still got this beanie thing on, and we're, like, yeah, like dude, tripping because Tim's going to say something. <laughs> so we're, 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 like, huddling up. We huddle up, and dude still has the beanie on, and Booz, or Coach Tim's like, man, Booz. Man, get rid of the beanie, dude. Come on, let's go. It's time to practice. And he takes it off, and he was like, everyone was, he was like, oh, sh- shoot. Hey, man, you might want to put that beanie back on. And everybody died laughing. And we were like, what is that? What's going on? He was like, man, I used a different barber. They, they beijing my hair. They left it on too long, and I can't wash this stuff out. And I was like, well, there's got to be a way that you watch this out because we're playing on national TV tomorrow. So it's the funniest thing is, you know, Booz had a hat on the whole entire time. And then we're about to play and we're about to play in, in tip off. And KG is like ragging on Booz. Like, what's that on your head? But it looked like you got like sharpie marker on your head and just going crazy but because it's a national televised game all the mics hot mics pick up all this content and so our like we all got it sent to us after after the game and it was great um but you know booze booze took it like a champ and you know he always has the games so yeah, that was the real devastating part. It wasn't just fodder coming from his teammates, but you've got KG and Paul Pierce and, you know, like the Celtics team coming at you as well. Man, and they, and they, 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 they let him hear it the entire time. It was great. It, it was I great. mean, exceptional story. And you're right. Booz has, um, you know, since then and at the time, just kind of owned it. Let, let, yeah. let's, let's do this really quick. Your Arkansas head coach, Eric Musselman, he's entering his third year. I mean – what is your assessment of, of Eric Musselman, not the coach, but Eric Musselman, the social media star, the thespian, the actor? What, what do you got? Dude, he's, he's uh, you know, and this is before joining the staff. You know, before joining the staff, I was a fan of his X's and O's. It's like, man, dude, this dude can really coach. He can, you know, he makes adjustments, in-game adjustments. His practices are intense. He, he has, he builds a real, real, real culture around here. And as an alumni, I was like, dude, I, I, I like Mus. I like, I like the, the hire. I love his staff, all that. Getting to know him as a person and seeing how he is in the community, knowing his, his family, his wife and his kids. And 
you know, how he interacts, how much he supports all the other coaches here at Arkansas and the student athletes, you know, he, he's always, his mind's always working. He's always thinking about the, the advantage of recruiting, always thinking about, you know, what's cool and innovative and getting fans interacting with, with, with him and our, and our players. And to me, I think he's got it. I think he's, he's one of the guys that has transitioned um, the modern college game. You know, it's not just about X and O's anymore. Um, you know, it's more of having X and O's, having a personality, knowing how to work the off the, the court stuff, um, interacting with local businesses and, you know, charities. And to me, just being from here, that goes a long way. And it's bigger than just basketball. It's bigger than just being the head coach for Arkansas Racebacks because now you're entwined in the, in the community. You're, you're now helping out the local boys and girls clubs and, and local students um, and students that go to the University of Arkansas. Like, you're not just the head coach. Like, he's, he's, he's now seeming in itself as a staple of Arkansas. And I think that it's growing like a wildfire and it's going to take the, the, the nation by storm. You retweeted something not long ago, and I, I guess it was a quote from Eric or something that Eric had put out on social media. And I, I, I grabbed it. I copied it so I can read it kind of verbatim here. And, and Eric recently said, hey, great program set, clearly communicated visions, missions, values and goals. But then they also create the environment for those things to come alive, which I would subscribe to it's one thing to really stand for something, but it's another to basically convince everyone and get everyone on the same page to then stand for that as well, or basically go in the direction you want it to, you know, from your time on staff, but then even over the last couple of years, just like you said, observing the program, like how has Arkansas embodied that the last couple of years? Accountability. Uh, you can say one thing, say another thing. Um, and say that's who you are as a person, but are you willing to stand on that and, and show by example? Like, coach is a living example of, like, he can't, like, it's easier for him to go down there and tell our student athletes, hey, man, you got to get in the gym pre and post practice. You know, you got you to gotta watch film, and you got to bust your butt, you know, during practice. You, you got to outwork it. The, your opponent and then you know coaches leaving here and going on the golf course and playing 18 holes and you know on family vacation because you know he has a beautiful family that, that that he that he has and can show him the world because you know he can afford it and you know but he doesn't do that what he does is he shows up first and he's cutting film with our GAs and he's, he's talked with our staff. He's talked with me and, and his son, Michael Musman, about recruiting uh, and, how, and trying to out-recruit the next, next coach. Um, he's putting the work in. He, he, he's telling guys, hey, we want guys that want to make it to the NBA. So we are focusing on the, the little attention to detail to make you from going to be good to elite. And if his attention to detail wasn't how it is, he can't preach to our guys to do that because I mean, you'd be a hypocrite, but he lives and walks the walk and talks and talks. And it is a, is a walking testimony to how the players are supposed to carry themselves in life. Like it's a small minor details that, that if you ignore it, you can allow it to snowball. And when you allow things to snowball, it can get out of hand. And, you know, I think he, he does a phenomenal job holding these guys accountable on, on what it means to be an Arkansas Razorback. Yeah, it's inspiring. And the results are obvious as well. I mean, the Elite Eight run, 25 win season, so on and so forth. You've got to go. Let's finish up on something somewhat fun. Best road accommodations or food restaurants around the NBA in the NBA market. Like, what, what you got here, man? And, uh, and, and take take a second if you need to. You need to get the I mean, <laughs> to me, to me, you know, I was I was able to be blessed to be able to play in New York, play in Chicago. Um, and so like the food was phenomenal in multiple places, depends on where you want, what, what kind of food you wanted. 
if it was Italian, if it was steak, if seafood. Um, and the, the thing about people like that they don't understand is, you know, in the NBA, after, you know, the NBA owners and the NBA Players Association signed in a collective bargaining agreement, like there's a certain standard that you have to kind of live by. <laughs> and um, like the hotels there, I mean, I, I, don't, I can't recall a hotel that I ever stayed at and the NBA was like, oh, that's this is not a nice hotel. I mean, you're saying at Ritz Carlton's and St. Regis and Four Seasons and in, in, in all these metropolitan cities, which are phenomenal. Um, and so, you know, every, I mean, hotels in San Francisco and New York and Chicago are elite. Um, hotels in St. Louis Carlton in D.C. Was, was always great because you never know who you might see. And a couple of times we we saw like the president's barricade or caravan that was driving by. And, you know, I thought that was super, super cool. Uh, a couple of times we, we played in London, played in Spain, played in the Philippines. Those are great. Um, and, you know, all, all the food places, I mean, there's not necessarily one because I like to eat. I mean, you can name you can name Gibson's in, in Chicago for a steakhouse. Um, I thought that was great. Um, I'm not much of a seafood guy, but Gibson's is one of my go-to places. I used to go to a lot, you know, as a player um, on away teams, but especially when I was living in Chicago. All-Star weekends were always great because you'd see like the true basketball fans, you know, you'd see, you know, Back then it was like Reggie Bush and Kim K and then Kim K and now and Kanye and you would see Jay-Z and Beyonce. I saw them a couple of times and, you know, playing in New York and you'd see Spike and Chris Rock and, you know, uh, you know sometimes A-Rod or Jennifer Lopez and you know, Seinfeld and, you know, um, Tracy Morgan. And, you know, I saw Hugh Hefner and in, in like the Playboy Playmates uh, in LA, I thought that was pretty great. Um, you know, in LA, playing it, and you know, when you're playing the Lakers, I mean, you'll see like Jack Nichols, Nicholas and Eddie Murphy, and uh, I don't know, uh, I don't know. I, I just thought that like seeing like Rihanna and Beyonce and so like that, I thought that was pretty pretty cool. I mean, there's star power on the court, but yes, I mean, in, in the NBA, there's one thing we know, and it's the star power that is lining the court as well. So, man, Ronnie Brewer, I, like, this has been great, enlightening stuff. It's been uh, it's been quite a treat and a blast just kind of go down memory lane with you here, man, and, and to hear about what's in store for Arkansas basketball as well. So, you've been kind to take some time out and share these stories. Thank you. Hey, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And go Hogs.